Hi all, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Tigran. I represent the personalized noise cancellation research group at uh, CRISP. Um, and I'll tell you about uh, a project that we did, uh, my group at CRISP, some time ago. Uh, the aim of this project uh, was uh, to facilitate distributed training, data service, or other routine uh, data processing tasks uh, with minimal ingredients. And we thought this would be an interesting topic uh, to present at this conference. Uh, this is a joint work with my colleagues uh, at our group, uh, two of them are here. Third, the, the last one is me. <laughs> uh, so the plan for today is as follows. Uh, I'll start with an over, overview of a typical training flow that we have. Uh, then I'll highlight uh, the need for parallelization or distributed computing in that context. Uh, then I'll very briefly list uh, some of the existing solutions uh, that deal with these kind of problems. Uh, next, I'll tell you why uh, or how we want to do it and why we want, we do, we want to do it, some sort of uh, motivation for our project. And finally, I'll present some details of the architecture. All right, so this is uh, a typical supervised learning training flow that we have. Uh, you may know that at CRISP we do uh, mainly various speech processing uh, algorithms. We train uh, deep neural networks for speech processing different tasks. Uh, and so the inputs uh, for our training pipeline would be uh, audios. Uh, this uh, raw audio files pass some data generation stage with various uh, augmentations, transformations, and so on uh, to prepare inputs for, for the training uh, process itself. And then uh, the data is uh, the, the, this uh, input is passed to the training and uh, uh, which iteratively improves uh, a model uh, and in the end we output a ready model and hopefully sell it. So uh, going a bit uh, deeper into this uh, data generation uh, flow, so we have the raw uh, audios audio files somewhere uh, on the disk. The first uh, part is to organize them into some uh, data set objects, let's say, to get, gather meta info about these audios, uh, their structure, what is in these audios, and so on. Based on that uh, information, we sample uh, audios depending on what we are training, Let's say if we are training a noise cancellation task, which is a typical thing we do at CRISP, uh, we sample speech, noise. Um, uh, and then we mix these uh, audios together, do various kinds of augmentations with the goal to uh, mimic uh, the input distribution of a model. For example, if it's a noise cancellation model, then you would get a noisy audio, a cleaned audio, and you would try to feed it uh, into the model to train on these inputs. The next step would be to batch the, these uh, inputs together into batches uh, and prepare for stochastic optimization. And then we, uh, we store these batches. Uh, uh, these batches are then fed into the training pipeline uh, possibly with some recycling where you gather some pool of batches and let the model uh, train a little bit uh, on this pool 
uh, and uh, for example, you could then pack uh, this input data uh, in a TensorFlow data set and, and let, let it train and pass uh, to the training process. So this, was, uh, this would be a typical flow of a data generation uh, procedure. Uh, next uh, step is the training itself. Uh, model training uh, can be seen as some sort of uh, function optimization. Uh, in deep neural networks, uh, uh, a deep neural network can be seen as a bunch of uh, parameters, like this uh, P here. And uh, what we do uh, is uh, we get some input, like for this noise cancellation application, we get uh, the noisy and clean audios. Uh, and we form a loss function from this input uh, and, uh, and, and the parameters. And we try to optimize, minimize this loss function. Uh, uh, so each step would be to get a new batch of input, form a loss function, do one uh, minimization step, uh, which changes uh, these parameters a little bit, uh, and then get another batch, do another optimization step, and so on. Uh, and each optimization step sort of uh, a little bit uh, improves these parameters, fits to the given uh, input x. But uh, overall, we want uh, the parameters uh, to be fit on the whole data, so that's why we do these uh, little in iterative steps. Every iterative uh, uh, minimization step uh, consists of these uh, sub-steps. Uh, you basically, because you want to minimize this loss function, uh, you compute uh, its gradients, and, and in, in this case, the inputs are fixed. Uh, you just want to perturb the, the, the parameters a little bit. So you compute the gradients uh, uh, with respect of the function with respect to these uh, parameters, and then uh, update the parameters on the directions pointed uh, by these gradients. There, there is an efficient algorithm for deep networks, uh, as you may know, uh, for uh, numerically computing these gradients, uh, which is called uh, backpropagation. And uh, it consumes the bulk of uh, uh, computation uh, on, comp on computing these uh, gradients. Uh, for typical uh, deep networks, uh, this computation consists of uh, mostly large matrix, uh, matrix operations, which are highly parallelizable. Uh, and uh, hence, uh, people use uh, specialized hardware, which is really good at this kind of computations, like GPUs or TPUs. Um, uh, uh, so what is uh, sp special about them is that they have uh, a lot of uh, computing cores and uh, they can do these specialized uh, operations uh, in parallel very quickly. Uh, this uh, specialized uh, hardware comes with specialized software. For instance, uh, for, for NVIDIA uh, GPUs, you would have uh, CUDA, which sits under uh, common uh, machine learning libraries like Torch and uh, TensorFlow. All right, so this, this was uh, a long story of uh, the, the detailed description of this uh, training uh, flow. And from the context uh, I've just uh, given you, uh, you could see that uh, uh, the, the components of our training flow uh, are quite different from each other. Uh, some would require a, C a lot of CPU computation, others would require uh, GPU. Uh, for example, data generation is mostly usually done 
on CPU while, uh, and occasionally on GPU, while training is uh, almost always done on GPU. Uh, so this means that, uh, you know, if there are different, uh, if there are components uh, in our pipeline that have different uh, speed and uh, space uh, characteristics, so there is some heterogeneity, and this motivates uh, uh, a parallel, uh, need, the need for parallelization. So we could benefit by parallelizing some components. Uh, so again, to highlight uh, this difference, uh, CPUs are general purpose uh, computation, uh, computational devices. Uh, so they should work for any computation. They use cache, RAM, or disk for storage. While GPUs are good at only specialized computation, like this matrix multiplication and this kind of stuff. Uh, they have many cores that, uh, that help parallelize these operations, but they have limited memory. Uh, they could also use ROM, but uh, it's expensive uh, to transfer stuff between ROM and GPU memory, so this should be avoided as much as possible. Uh, all right, so this, this was a kind of a motivation why one would want to do parallelism in this setting. Um, uh, for, so we could, uh, so we had these two components, data generation and training, and we can uh, try to parallelize each of them. Uh, for data service or data generation, uh, parallelism would be to let some independent processes uh, either on the same machine or on different machines to generate data and somehow store on the machine, on the training machine so that it can be delivered to the to training process. Uh, so that would be a typical uh, distributed data service. On the other hand, uh, you could also, uh, you might also want to uh, distribute the uh, GPU computation, so the model training itself. Uh, so for, for, for example, in this uh, diagram, which re represents what's called the data parallel training, uh, you want to train your, your model on very large batches of data. Uh, and uh, the back propagation with, with such uh, large batches um, doesn't uses so much memory that it doesn't fit on the GPU, on a single GPU. So what you would do in this case, you would duplicate your model uh, uh, across several uh, uh, computers, across several GPUs. Uh, you would form smaller batches, different batches come from the data generation uh, to the different uh, uh, computers with the model duplicates. Each of them computes the gradients uh, on its corresponding share of this big batch. You could, you could consider these two together as one big batch of data. So each one computes the gradients. Uh, on its corresponding share, but they don't uh, update the parameters. They just compute the gradients and send to uh, a single aggregation or parameter update uh, uh, process or machine where these uh, gradients are aggregated together and then uh, the update happens here. So there is also a, a copy of the model here. Uh, and, and after this update, you should update the parameters here so, uh, for the next step. So after updating, the parameters are communicated back to these uh, gradient computation uh, uh, machines. So this, this would be one regime for uh, for distributed uh, training. Another uh, case could happen 
when your model itself uh, is so huge that uh, you can't, it can't uh, uh, fit on a single GPU, even with small batches. So uh, assuming that your model has a layered structure, which, which is the case for uh, deep, uh, most, most uh, deep neural networks, uh, you could partition your model into subsequences uh, of layers and allocate the first uh, few layers to one machine, then the next few layers to another machine and so on. Uh, in sort of a sequential uh, manner. Or if it has a branching, you could also do uh, branching here. So you could have uh, sort of parallelism. Uh, and because of this layered structure, evaluating your model uh, on a data could be done by first sending this data to the first few layers. So they compute uh, their output, and only their output is sent to the next layer. So it's a much uh, smaller communication than if, if you sent the whole thing, uh, and so on in this sequential manner. And then you could also compute the gradients uh, in, again in a sequential manner, but uh, in, in the opposite order. Uh, starting from the last layers. So you could compute the gradients uh, with respect to these last parameters, uh, send the result back to the previous la uh, computer, and so on. And this would do your uh, uh, gradient computation. Uh, similarly, you could, do, uh, up, uh, you could uh, transfer updates across this chain of computers. All right, there are other uh, regimes for distributed training too, but uh, I won't go into them. This is just to give you a flavor of what needs to be done for uh, distributed uh, training. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, existing solutions for this kind of tasks because these are really important tasks. Um, starting from the TensorFlow data service, Torch, uh, Horovod, uh, Spark, Ray, Anyscale, and uh, their combinations and so on. These are uh, uh, really versatile uh, frameworks that can handle uh, all kinds of uh, set training settings, uh, uh, all kinds of libraries and so on. They are very complicated. Um, while, uh, and they can work on hundreds of uh, uh, machines, uh, either local or on the cloud and so on. Um, but then what we want? What we want, so we just departed from the fact that at CRISP we had a moderate size uh, data center, we trained moderate size models like up to uh, some tens of millions parameters. And uh, we didn't uh, have uh, MLOps dedicated to this. And we decided to, rather than going, uh, jumping into this uh, pile of uh, <coughs> different frameworks, to build something uh, ourselves uh, from very simple means uh, with, with, the, with these objectives. So what we don't want like it to be super versatile or super general. Uh, we just want it to be just enough complex for our setting. So to cover the things that I listed there. Uh, easy to implement. So our goal was to do it quickly. Uh, uh, transparent so that we can just jump into it and debug if something happens. Easy to read uh, the code even. Uh, flexible, uh, independent of the ML library that we use, or even uh, useful for general uh, data processing tasks, and somewhat uh, customizable. All right, so uh, we would want to cover uh, scenarios uh, like this, for instance, uh, where we have a simple data generation uh, parallelism, or uh, things like this, when we have several uh, stages 
of uh, data, data, data generation. So uh, this first level uh, nodes generate some, some data which is delivered, uh, which could be some uh, kind of data processing, which goes to the second la layer uh, where you do some other kind of uh, processing. For example, this could be some, some uh, GPU processing of the data, and then uh, this is uh, delivered to the training. Or we would like to have uh, uh, to support things like this, uh, data parallel training, where you have, uh, again, distributed data generation, serving data to uh, distributed uh, data parallel training. Uh, okay, so let's consider what happens, uh, uh, what we do on this simple uh, uh, setting. So we want this uh, data generation uh, uh, machines to just uh, somehow put the data they generate on the training machine. Uh, uh, we, we can we can just do this by mounting uh, some piece of the ROM or, or, or disk uh, of this uh, training machine on these machines and let them just put the data in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, partition. Uh, the issue here is that uh, since they are independent processes, they can just uh, conflict with each other or overwrite each other's data and so on. So we need someone to control them, to somehow synchronize them. And we decided to do this uh, uh, with the HTTP web server. Okay, so in this uh, case, uh, the, the data generation processes send HTTP requests here and ask uh, for a location or, uh, or what, what to generate and where to, and where to put the results. And this uh, training process sends a HTTP request uh, to, the, to the web server uh, asking uh, for, for a completed uh, data, data that has been generated and where to read it from. Um, so this would be a sort of a control layer for our uh, framework. And, and this part would be uh, the data layer. Uh, the data layer does uh, basically the whole uh, heavy data traffic. Um, well, NFS is just one way of uh, doing this, which comes for free. It's just there if you log into your Linux. Uh, and, um, and the control layer does uh, controlling and ex with exchanging very small messages uh, so it has a minimal overhead in terms of traffic. Uh, by the way, this is a police head if you, you don't <laughs> notice. Uh, some people don't recognize it. Um, okay, so the data layer is uh, realized by just NFS export, in our case. Um, you just uh, mount uh, uh, disks here and there, and, uh, and uh, each data generation process writes uh, its data to a, to a local location, and the NFS does the rest, uh, while the web server can be implemented by, some, uh, by any off-the-shelf HTTP implementation. For example, you could take Flask. Uh, it's pretty simple. All right, so, uh, but let's see what, uh, what happens if you have such a, a bit more complicated uh, uh, structure here. So in this case, uh, if you have a multi-level data generation uh, pipeline, then you, you would have uh, several uh, web servers sitting in between and controlling uh, separate sessions. So this data generation would be a separate session and this would be a separate session. And uh, uh, th this web server would serve uh, uh, data to this one. So this would uh, relay the data and then it comes back to these guys and so on. I will uh, explain it a bit 
more detail later. So what are the main actors uh, or software entities in, in this framework? So we have uh, a worker uh, uh, which requests uh, uh, jobs from the web server. It says what to do, where to write, and uh, performs these jobs and uh, puts uh, where web server tells it. Uh, it, it should be implemented by the user, so user just inserts this data generation code and, uh, and the rest of the communication stuff is already there. Uh, next comes the cache. Uh, this is the other end of the, of the framework, so where, where the data is fetched. Um, uh, so this guy is responsible for, it, it's called by the user and it's responsible for fetching completed jobs or data and passing it on to the next stage, like training. And finally, we have a web server manager, uh, which is responsible for several tasks. Uh, first, it creates uh, jobs and distributes, distributes them to the workers. Uh, this is done by its uh, sub-module job generator which can be customized, like you say, how exactly these uh, jobs are made, what is required to be done, and so on. And then it uh, answers cache requests, the web server manager. So give me that data, uh, and it points to the places where data is. This is done by job dispatcher. And uh, finally, web server manager uh, keeps some statistics uh, of uh, what is going on in this whole uh, distributed uh, uh, session. And it's also responsible for managing the session state, restoring stop sessions and so on, controlling the number of workers that are there. Uh, and quite conveniently, if you have a web server, uh, you can, uh, it can host a web page. So we created a, a small HTML uh, web page where we display all the statistics about the data generation, like which, com which computer uh, with which speed serves the data, or which cache has, uh, consumes with what speed, and so on. Uh, and plus, on this web page, you can uh, specify how many workers uh, you want. You can change the number of workers, and so on. It's uh, quite convenient. All right, so let's see who is who in this particular configuration. So here we would have uh, uh, workers, uh, of course, on the first level, and they are managed by their corresponding uh, web server manager. Uh, as you can see, workers wear hard hats. Uh, on the second layer, you also have workers. <clears throat> and there is a corresponding uh, web server manager here managing these workers, uh, so uh, giving them jobs. And then there is a cache in the training process that asks this web server to, to, to give data. And uh, this other web server also contains a cache of this uh, first session. So uh, these guys create data. They give it uh, as, as ordered by this web server manager. A and then this web server manager asks for data, this, guy, this one, and, and then it redistributes the data to the second level uh, workers. And when they are done, it's, it's passed on to the, to the second level cache. Uh, so with this uh, simple uh, 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 block, you can create uh, several sessions uh, which could form uh, various uh, more complicated topologies uh, like this uh, tree-like thing or a directed acyclic graph. All right, so uh, next uh, let's see uh, what exactly these uh, entities do. So all a worker does is this simple logic. At the be beginning of the session, it connects to the web server and then executes this loop. So request a job, do the job, store and notify the, the web server, and, and so on. 
Uh, that's pretty simple. Cache is also quite simple. Uh, it again connects to the web server uh, at the beginning of the session. Request uh, upon a user request, uh, requests a job, uh, reads, uh, maybe caches uh, optionally, delivers uh, the data to the user, and then uh, loops. Uh, web server manager is uh, slightly more complicated. So it does four things, uh, and well, these are done by its uh, sub-modules. The first thing is uh, answering worker job requests. So upon such a request, it creates a job, sends to a worker, and when worker comes back uh, with a completed job, it marks this job uh, completed. And so the next step would be to answering uh, cache requests. Uh, so, uh, upon uh, user request, cache asks da for data to the web server, uh, which picks a completed job that was marked completed before, and sends it to the cache. Uh, and that's it. The next thing that we do, that the web server uh, manager does, is managing the, the number of workers. Um, uh, upon a user request, so the user goes to the uh, web page, enters a number of workers, and the web server manager somehow controls this, uh, makes sure that this number of workers are active on each machine. So the, on the web, site, so side, uh, web page, you have uh, uh, fields for each uh, machine, and you can control the no number of workers on each of them. And finally, Web Server Manager keeps uh, statistics and shows on the web page. Again, the user can go to the web page, refresh it, and see uh, what, what is the speed of this or that component of the, of the, of the training uh, pipeline. Uh, there are also other uh, minor features, like uh, you could customize the way the data is stored, read. So given this architecture, you can overwrite uh, uh, the particular parts, uh, the, the low-level parts. Uh, then you can also supply additional job context. So, you can, uh, so it doesn't only serve uh, machine learning data generation uh, 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 itself, but you can also do some more general uh, jobs that have some context uh, uh, and uh, this can be done by customizing the job generator. Uh, so you can do general data processing with this framework. A uh, user can supply data integrity checking. For example, if your session uh, crashed, for some reason, and you want to restore it without using the already generated data, you can check whether these uh, already generated ones are valid, and the user can give the code for checking. And then there is also a lot of uh, logging that can be very helpful to keep, tr keep track of the issues, uh, debugging, and so on. So this is typically how it's uh, used. You start the web server with the shell command, uh, give it uh, some arguments like where is the web server, some configuration file, and the session name so that other entities uh, in this uh, session can connect to it. Uh, run a similar uh, command uh, from uh, remote machines to connect to the web server, uh, uh, and this would be for, for uh, starting workers on this machine. Uh, then you start your training uh, session, which contains uh, uh, the cache. Again, do similar, uh, give similar parameters so that it can talk to the server. Open the web page in a browser, start a number of processes, and uh, let it flow. Uh, so that was basically it. I hope it was not too quick. Um, so the point uh, uh, is that um, there are, of course, many existing sophisticated solutions that might be uh, necessary 
if you have a, a very large data center with a lot of uh, uh, complex requirements and you are very tight on the performance, um, uh, you could still uh, build something simple yourself, say in a week. And with the architecture that I presented, uh, the benefits of such approach would be that uh, you would have something uh, really transparent uh, that you can jump into the code and do stuff uh, whenever you want. Uh, it's easy to read, deba debug, and uh, it's quite flexible so you can use it for any other, uh, any tasks other than machine learning. Just general uh, data processing and so on. Uh, the name of this, uh, the internal name, let's say, of this uh, framework uh, in our group is Delta, which was uh, inspired by this uh, river deltas. Uh, well, of course, river deltas uh, uh, flow the other way. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you can imagine, uh, but, but the data is not the water, it's the salmon that uh, jumps uh, <laughs> the opposite direction. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, thanks for your attention, uh, that was it. <laughs> if you have any questions, you are right, most We're welcome. We're waiting for this to be an open source thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, me too. <laughs> any questions? So the point was, sorry, that, uh, that it's so easy to implement that uh, you don't, wa you don't uh, Want to open source it? <laughs> yep, please. Um, well, the, the thing is that uh, this, I, I guess uh, you mean the uh, model parallel tra training where you split uh, the model into parts. Well, uh, this, of course, you can do it uh, uh, with, by adding, uh, by, by making a separate session for each connection between the computers. That's not uh, super efficient, but uh, you could still do it. So you have, a, you have a first layers, second layers, and so on in different computers, and you have a web server manager in between each of them. So for this case, uh, it's, it works. It can work, but uh, we didn't try it. We didn't need to do it. Uh, but uh, I guess it's not the most efficient way to do it. Let's put it that way. But uh, on the other hand, we tried this uh, for uh, model, uh, for data parallelism, when you have many uh, copies of your model on different machines. And for this case, uh, you, could, you could do it. Welcome. So you should have something, some, some, at least some parallelism for this to be uh, efficient. If you have branching instead of sequential thing, then uh, it, it's more efficient because you have many workers re reporting to the same web server. Uh, while if it's sequential, it can still be made work, but it's not very efficient. Does it give uh, similar results as uh, local training? Because uh, as I understand, this depends on which kind of gradient synchronization are you doing. Because uh, it can uh, based on based on this fact, uh, we can get different uh, results in final step of optimization. Yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, of course it can't be the same as local training uh, because uh, it depends on the interconnections between the computers or how high is the performance of the links between them. 
But, uh, uh, ah, you mean like uh, whether it gives the same result? Yes. In terms ah. of final, uh, in terms uh, of which point we get the final. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on, on the loss function that you are optimizing. But uh, this is for the case when it's OK to do that. So in loss functions, which are OK to aggregate like this, where you aggregate along the batch, this is exactly equivalent to local training. But uh, more generally, of course, no. So in these cases, the uh, data parallel tra training is just not applicable. So you wouldn't want to do it. You have highlighted multiple times that you want to keep it simple, this framework. Uh, and there are these other solutions that are, that are sophisticated. But they are sophisticated for a reason. Yeah. So what is your plan when your requirements will start to grow and you will get all these different tasks that you now have to handle? Do you plan to like uh, develop your own framework by that time or transfer to spark or something similar? Yeah, so um, uh, the answer is that uh, uh, this is a trade-off between uh, like write yeah. the time you spend on, on writing it yourself and reading the docs. In this case, it was easier to develop yeah. than writing the do uh, reading the docs. So then if it's really complex, if the things are changing, then, of course, you want to adopt the more versatile solution, right? But uh, for us, uh, they didn't. For example, if your data center is, uh, is growing, yeah. you can just keep uh, growing your so software if there is something already there. So yeah, the, the answer would be that if things are changing fast, then I would just go and take something else. Because I'm from Yandex and basically from the team that does what, what you're doing, but we're way past that point already. Like we started at your point, but now we're like we have to handle all these different. I can uh, imagine. It's kind of hard. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sure, sure. This is uh, th this is as I said. We have uh, we have a moderate size uh, data center, and we don't didn't have. Uh, it's not a very fast changing environment. So it was worth doing this. But for a more, uh, then you would, you would also have a ML ops team, right? I, I suppose. Uh, uh, <laughs> we I, don't. I, yeah, uh, <laughs> we, we are more focused on like data engineering, uh, like data pipelining stuff. So I see. Mm. OK, we OK. We're not about ML. OK, OK, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if uh, things blow up, you have to go to more to, to the professionals. <laughs> yep. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that this is a simple um, flow, but as in every distributed system, like management of the flow is more difficult than the training itself. Have you yeah. implemented like the retries, resumes, and yeah, sure. collection? And what are the issues there? Because in a lot of mature systems, it, it is. It yeah, it's uh, first you develop something that works, and then it uh, uh, crashes a lot, and, and then you slowly uh, let it mature. So, well, we didn't want to spend too much time on this. So, it, it's uh, at least this uh, resuming uh, uh, or you know changing the number of workers, uh, let's say, or, or restoring the data that is there, but the session crashed and so on. This this was uh, not that hard to do. Of course, uh, you need to to to, to do it carefully. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess the main thing was that to to not lose uh, the time that you spent uh, in your training or data generation when it crashes. So you can't just discard the data. So the main part was, I guess, handling that. But that was easy. When you restart the session to collect the d data that was done before and continue serving. Um, and you have probably mentioned that, at least that uh, 
workers were in different nodes, or they could have been processes to inside the same computer? Uh, either of them. So they could be different processes on the same computer uh, than some others on other computer. And so uh, the comp communication is between processes. But the web server also uh, gathers information for each machine separately. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it would be really interesting for you to look at the Ray because they have done Something similar to a solar. But you have done it in a, in a smaller. Uh, okay, so yeah, I will probably read about it <laughs> more <laughs> deeply. I, I know about it a bit, but uh, only because I wanted to know what else is out there. So, yeah, and yeah. it's not so difficult to set up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. For the distributed systems, is it really necessary to have a secret? or do you have the web server mobile for that purpose? For example, I don't know, like you have distributed like, several machines which are doing the generation, you just send the data to some kind of log, uh, I don't know, like, some server, and took the logs, and later on classify them based on the machine number, for example. Uh, well, from this... Uh, or it is really necessary to have them you could say uh, you could hard code some specific things like uh, you take your process ID and the machine uh, host name, make a name out of it. So, for example, if uh, where do they take the names uh, of files uh, to write? They should somehow cook it, or they could just ask the web server. This is like a clean synchronization. So this is one of the reasons to have uh, this kind of control. And another is uh, when they want context. So the workers could get the context, uh, what exactly should be generated, etc., from the web server. So uh, from a centralized place. So if they were independent, but they want to do a single task, they need to do it coordinated. So one doesn't repeat what, what another does. Uh, so uh, this I kind of... It's already uh, well, if you start the processes, they start from, from the scratch. So they should somehow be distinguished from each other. And uh, a centralized entity could be the one to, to do this distinguishing. OK, I guess no more questions. Thank you very much uh, for coming to my talk and enjoy the fireworks. <laughs>